It's time for Declare Your Independence with Ernest Hancock. Fight for here on Declare Your Independence with me, Ernest Hancock from Phoenix, Arizona, B E A U. Beautiful studios of Freedoms with an S, FreedomsPhoenix.com. Yeah, I was distracted uh, reading some stuff here. Let me t- let me tell you that yeah, we found a new friend. All right, we got we got us a new friend, John Gibbler. Am I saying that right, John? You are, yeah. Okay, now he's author of two books. I mean, his first one uh, just a few years ago was Mexico Unconquered, Chronicles of Power and Revolt. Give me, give me a 30-second on that book. What were you talking about there? That book is a, is a focus on the social mobilizations across Mexico, resistance movements from teacher strikes to indigenous people's mobilizations, anti-electoral fraud groups, and also an attempt to really analyze the nature of impunity and the outrageous administration of, of state power in Mexico that leads to so many uprisings and mobilizations. Okay, so who is trying to conquer them? They're unconquered by whom? So that's a reference, of course, to the 500 years of of colonial legacy. First, the argument is that first the Spaniards arrive and there's a direct war of conquest, and that with the independence wars in the early 1800s, that conquer, the period of conquest was just reconfigured. It was still a colonial era, but now instead of Madrid being home base, it's Mexico City. And then again in the 1910 revolution that you know, tore up Mexico for almost 10 years, that all it did was reconfigure the political class. But even though the vast majority of the conquest has, has taken place, it's still ongoing. There, there are very large regions, or relatively large regions of Mexico, where indigenous populations are almost untouched by the state. And of course that has taken the like the form of neglect of marginalization over the past especially you know half a century um but now with discovery of new mining techniques um you know ecotourism and things like that the state wants to dispossess once again people from the already marginalized lands that they were pushed into um to take over those lands extractive industries and all of that and so there's still like this like 500 years later, these processes of conquest and revolt taking place. So we've been through this here, the Native Americans, same thing. So I'm, I'm, I'm looking at uh, a map, and you see you have different portions of Mexico that have not been industrialized or citified or developed or highways going through and railroad and all that kind of stuff. And you say the word they've been neglected, maybe sometimes being neglected by the central planners is better than not. Right. I mean, the irony here is that, it, it, you know, fast forward a couple hundred years and the neglect and marginalization might have been better than the kind of attention they were given. Right. May you, uh, you know, is that the Chinese curse? Uh, may you come to the attention of uh, important people and right. live in interesting times? Well, exactly. they're like, hey, uh, we're coming to the attention of uh, some important, powerful people and it's starting to get interesting especially when people are dying around you. So I'm, I'm looking at um, also the connection between these two books, Mexico Unconquered, Chronicles of Power and Revolt, and then To Die in Mexico, Dispatches from Inside the Drug War. Now, are you finding that the people that are conquering or want to conquer, are they profiting? Are they funded? Are they better off because of drugs being illegal and gives them the power to be able to conquer, or is the government trying to oppose another power that's funded by the drug war? Or are they one and the same? I mean, what's the connection between the central planners and the people that are making a profit from the central plan by making drugs illegal in this prohibition? Give me the connection. I absolutely think that the drug wars, it has been administered, especially since the end of 2006, has become the new spearhead of conquest. It's being used by the state to militarize society, um, fund, heavily fund the police and military forces, which are known to be entirely infiltrated by the drug trade itself, um, to supposedly fight itself. And it becomes a pretext for, as I said, mass militarization. And also, since there is now just this overwhelming 
amount of violence, political assassinations, executions of indigenous rights defenders, people in teachers' unions, that kind of thing, those just get washed under the rug. Um, since there's so much bloodshed, so many bodies falling, and nobody investigates anything, it becomes a perfect cover of impunity, a kind of cloak of impunity to be spread over this whole other process of conquest. In fact, the, the events that led to the writing of Mexico Unconquered that I reported on directly took place throughout the year of 2006, especially, and then a little bit in 2007. And as I was sitting down to write the book in 07, 08, I was watching the drug war unfold and on spiral. Started reporting on it at the same time. It's like, we can't ignore this. We can't, um, as someone involved in... Did you expect it, though? I mean, when you were writing and researching this, I mean, didn't you see that this was going to be the result of them cracking down on this thing? And the reason it's 5% of the murders get investigated by the police is oftentimes... It was the police. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, the, look at the numbers. In Ciudad Juarez, when they sent the army into the streets, the execution rate doubled. When they replaced the army with the federal police, the execution rate went up again by 50%. So how do you explain a city with uh, 1.5 million inhabitants, some 5,000-plus federal militarized police patrolling the city nonstop. You can't go outside and walk down the street anywhere in the city for five minutes and not see a convoy of masked federal police with, you know, mounted machine guns and assault rifles aimed in the streets. Can't see them go by. And yet seven to ten bodies drop a day and nobody gets caught. Okay. All that? right. Let me, let me uh, let's try to equate. Now, you live in California, right? Back and forth. I've spent most of the past five years in Mexico, and I come back up to California once, twice a year. Okay, so I mean, you're familiar with America. <laughs> Very much so. Born and raised in Texas. Okay, so you're looking at the United States and Mexico, and I've done this because we've traveled uh, to Mexico, so not recently, though. I mean, I'm just kind of like, I'm, you know, I'm good. But I took my young children, whenever we would cross across the border, I would always make the point, I go, watch. When we cross this imaginary line in the desert, you're going to have prosperity and paved roads and, you know, uh, leashed dogs and convenience stores that are air conditioned and whatever and bathrooms. Okay. You go across this line, all of a sudden everything changes. Why? Well, it's, you know, the bottom line is respect for property rights and, and government defends individual rights so that when people do bad stuff, you know, you can pretty much count on the bad guys going to jail. Well, that's, you know, rapidly going away. But I'm looking at where you say you have armed men, masked, no less, and probably not a name badge on, out in the streets. That's where we're going. And I'm going, why is it that you have so much death and destruction there and not so much here? I mean, it's getting up. It's going to happen. So then you get into this Second Amendment, people able to defend themselves kind of thing. Do you see that as a detriment? or a solution in Mexico. And then when we come back, we'll get you on this because I want to finish with this. We have a an attempt by the United States had a program to where the BATF was wanting, sending, and pushing firearms into Mexico as some kind of an op to justify something. There's something weird going on. What happened if the people in Mexico were able to defend themselves? Would that be better? Not? We'll talk about it.